Well, we always start with the numbers, and today will be no different. Okay. 60 tests, 249 wickets at 23.7, a best of eight for 92, 15 fifers, two tenfers, 102 ODIs, 142 wickets at 21, a best of five for 26, 222 first-class matches, 778 wickets at 23, 39 fifers, and five tenfers. Mike Selvey described his run-up as male- malevolent stealth personified, hence the nickname Whispering Death. Since then, this man has been a deeply respected voice in the game as a commentator and custodian. And now the man has done uh, something potentially more significant than that, in my view. Uh, following his stirring comments at the commencement of the England Test season last year on Sky, he has lent all of himself to a book that I can honestly say is one of the most cogent, accessible and persuasive works on race and life that I've ever come across. Uh, So we're here this morning, two idiots off the internet in Melbourne (laughs) at 6am to learn uh, from an ornament to the game, a humanitarian exemplar in the Cayman Islands, uh, whispering death himself, Michael Holding. Michael, an honour and privilege to have you on The Great Cricketer. Thank you very much, Sam. Glad to be joining you guys. Michael, your book is called Why We Kneel, How We Rise. Uh, It's a powerful, unflinching special piece of work that must have caused you to plumb some serious depths uh, to gather your insights. Uh, I I can't think of a similar book across sport that so comprehensively chronicles race issues across sports, across countries and through history like this one does. Uh, How has the, before we sort of get into it, how has the process been for you um, and how do you feel now that it's uh, been set free for people to read? Well, to be honest, um, before I did this book, I didn't really want to do it. And then when I was convinced that it needed to be done, I was worried because this is not a task that you take on lightly. It is not an easy task as anyone will know to write a book like this because you'll have a lot of people out there looking to pick holes in something like this. And so I was extremely nervous, but I had a good ghost writer who could structure things for me. I did a lot of research. Obviously, I don't know how to structure books and structure paragraphs and that sort of thing. And I got a lot of help in that regard from him. And at the end of the day, I am happy with the product. But as I said to other people, Sam, this is just the beginning. This is like going out and spinning a coin and winning the toss. What I'm hoping now is although this book is finished, that this book still has a lot of work to do. I'm hoping that this book will convince a lot of people that things need to change. I'm looking for people to educate themselves with this book because a lot of people are going through life not really knowing the truth. Blacks and whites have been going through life being brainwashed a certain way Mm. and not really knowing exactly what the situation is. And you can go through your entire life, you know, gentlemen, you can go through from your kid and what you are told. And it is easy for you to absorb things because it, it keeps on being repeated to you. Whether it's true or not, because of the repetitive nature, you then believe it to be the truth. And I know I went through my life with that sort of situation, with me being told a lot of things, and just believe it to be the truth. Until later on, if you can explore and delve into things, you can then realize, hey, this thing couldn't really be the way that they have told me. So what I'm hoping that this book will jerk a few people, let them read it, let them say, hey, is this really true? Let me go and really find out for myself what the situation is. And then if people can do that and can educate themselves, I'm hoping that that will change things. Mm. Mikey, you sort of said there, sort of kicked off with what happened on Sky. You said your piece there was Sky. And then Thierry Henry gives you a phone call. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well... I didn't get a phone call from Thierry when I, immediately on that first day when I did that thing before I started to play. The call from Thierry came the second day after I did that, Sky, that interview on Sky News. Mm. I went back to the commentary box and my boss said to me, Mikey, I hope you don't mind, but Thierry on recall because Thierry works, worked with Sky. It was a football funded. Yep. Thierry got in touch and said he wanted to speak to you, and we gave him your number. I said, sure, not a problem. And that is when I then spoke to him after my second interview. 
And we had a good long chat because he said, after when I saw you on Sky News and you broke down, I had to talk to you because he said, growing up as a young black man, you're told that black people don't cry. You don't cry enough in public at any rate because that's showing weakness. And he's, he was told, you don't do that. And when he saw, saw what happened, he said, hey, it's okay. You can feel emotion. You can express emotion. And that's why he wanted to talk to me. And he said, listen, we need to, a lot of, to do a lot of work on this thing. And I said, okay. And even at that point, it was not the plan to write the book. But when we eventually decided, okay, we're going to do the book, I got back in touch with him. And I said, Tia, remember you said we had a lot of work. This is what I'm planning. Would you be willing to get involved? And he said, absolutely. Huh. And that's how the theory on me thing started. Yeah. yeah. You, you sort of referenced the journey that you've been on there, Marky, and part of the, um, the openings of the book uh, reflect on your first tour of England in uh, when you were 22 years old in 1976, and you notice a huge throng of West Indians coming to watch you play. How aware were you at the time, at the time of, of the context of Caribbean immigrants to the UK as part of the Windrush generation? Because you talk so much and so eloquently about the sense of how much they wanted you to win. Mm -hmm. Um, over there, what, what what lessons did you learn over there when you were observing that? Because I think even as Australians, we don't there is no similar ex specific experience like that. What what was that experience yeah. like for you? Well, initially, Sam, I I didn't really recognize exactly what it meant to the West Indian living in England. You know, I went there twice before I was a regular visitor to in, visitor to England. I went there in '76 with the West Indies team, but when you go on a tour, I'm 22 years old. I'd never played county cricket, so I have no real experience of England. I don't know a lot of people in England. So I go there, I'm with the West Indies team. You travel on the bus and you move from county to county, playing against the counties, you play the, the international games and you go home. Obviously, you meet a few West Indians because you have a lot of guys in the team that have played county cricket and they have friends in the UK. But I am not really getting into the English society and really experiencing a lot of what's happening mm. in, in the English society. So I come across a little bit of racism, I brush it off. I said, this doesn't fit into my life. This is not where I live. When I go back to Jamaica, I'll be fine. I go back in 1980, it's a similar situation. But then you get to meet more people and you get to hear more of their experiences. And then throughout the 80s, I'm in England on a regular basis. And I started playing county cricket. And you get to then realize exactly what the West Indies team and West Indies cricket means to these people living in England. That is why they want you to win every game. If you play a game of marbles, they want you to win because they want to identify with you and identify with success because in their life, they are not told that they are good. They are not told that they are of worth. But when they can identify with success and identify with brilliance, they feel better. They walk around feeling a lot better. I spoke to a gentleman who works in the West Indian newspaper yesterday in England. And he said when he was growing up, he was born in England, a black guy born in England, but his father is from the Caribbean. He said when he was growing up, every time the West Indies won and he saw his father, it was as if his father got five years younger. He was walking out around with his chest out, pushed out because he felt brilliant. He felt great that these people from the same place that he's from are doing all these great things. And that is when I then realized in the 80s, it came home to me more. I got an inkling, but it came home to me more the more times I got involved in England to what this thing meant to West Indians. It's a really interesting point, Mikey, about the first time people experience racism. Because when you spoke when you spoke to Usain Bolt, who was growing up in Jamaica, where you're from as well, obviously, and he was yeah. saying that um, he saw classism, but with, because Jamaica is predominantly a black uh, community, he didn't really see it until he left it. And then, yeah. and then in the final chapter, if I can read a quote, he said. You say, indeed, what was striking to me when talking to these athletes was how often they would have been brought up in multicultural environments only to suffer racism as soon as they left, which is a really interesting thing to me that they'd sort of grown up not experiencing it. And then when they had experienced, they'd already been sort of superstar athletes in their own right. Yes, yes. And Michael Johnson was the same thing. Yeah. He did not experience racism until he went to college. Now, by the time you get to college in the U.S., you're a grown man, not a grown man per se, but you, you know, you're well beyond teenage days and you're now getting into, into life. And he heard 
one of his college mates, a white college mate, passed a remark and he said to himself, that doesn't sound right. Mm. You know, he hadn't heard people say that sort of thing before, but it just occurred to him that that didn't sound right. Thierry Henry, the first time he came across racism again, as you said, was when he left his community to go and play football in mm. a small village. And he saw this look, this look on people's faces and he thought, why are they looking at us like this? Because he came across white folks in his community. As he said, he traveled without leaving because on the different floors in, in the building in which he lived, you had Portuguese, you had Russians, you had people from Africa, you had people from the Caribbean. So he was traveling, meeting all these people without actually leaving his community. But as soon as he left his community, it's a different story. Mm. And that is the problem. You know, you, if you can live together in a community because of your social economic background, you are similar. Why can't you live together outside of that community when the social economic um, background is different? Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. We're just, I suppose we're talking about early experiences of racism when you come from a place where you don't have it mm. beforehand. And in that same series in, in 1976, mm. Marky, that, that's, the, that's the one, and I'm sure you've spoken about it over 1,000 times, where, <laughs> where Tony Gregg, the England captain, said he intended to make the West Indies grovel. Um, I, I won't ask you about it really broadly, but I want to ask you something specific about that. As a 22-year-old, as a was it clear to you then that, prejudice could be expressed even unconsciously because you go on to make really clear that you don't think Tony Gregg um, was or is or was a racist. Um, but but prejudice can be expressed even unconsciously through the subtleties of language. Mm. Definitely. Definitely. But that is the problem as well because of the brainwashing that we have had. You have unconscious prejudice and you have unconscious racism. You have unconscious thoughts. It, they are in your head. But you don't even realize how racist those thoughts are or the expression that you make. And I gave up quite a few examples of this subconscious bias that people have in the book. 2016, if you remember in the book, I made mention of a study that they did at Yale University in 2016, where they brought in over 100 teachers and told the teachers sitting in a room, we are going to show you a video and look out for bad behavior. Mm. They had eye tracking technology focused on the teachers, all of them, their faces. And immediately the video started, they started to focus on the black kids. At the end of the study, they gave them the results and they were all embarrassed except for one person. Well, I will leave people to speculate as to why that one person wasn't embarrassed. But that just shows you that those teachers did not have any racist intent or any racist thoughts, but subconsciously, it's almost as if, as I said before, things get into people's head by osmosis because the constant pounding, the constant thing that they keep on hearing and people keep on telling them. And subconsciously, they just thought, oh, bad behavior, they got to be black kids. Mm. Another situation was that very well published situation with that lady in Central Park with her dog. A black man is telling her to do the right thing. He's not accosting her to do anything but what the law says. Put your dog on a leash, please, ma'am. Mm. She decides, I am white. You are black and you are going to dictate to me? Mm. I'll just call the police and tell them a black man is here intimidating me or is, or is abusing me. Because already that is in her mind from the society in which she is growing up that she is always right and all she has to do is call the police on this black man. She might not be basically a racist, you know, but that is in her thoughts. That is already embedded in her head. And that is what comes out. Mm. Mm. Marky, um, j just on that as well, because we're getting into the uh, your sort of uh, thesis, I suppose, on racism and where it comes from, which I found... Uh, fascinating and really um, important and it's going to be for readers to judge themselves as well. So uh, I wrote something down here. So very few, few people would deny the existence of racism in all societies, but I don't know if I'm speaking about just Australia or more broadly, but the, the term has come to have such heinous connotations. It sometimes feels like it's worse to be called racist than to be racist. Like the atrocity of the accusation 
silences examination of the behaviour. It raises the bar of it so high that we don't even look at it anymore. So because, because racism, as you were saying there, is connected with in, is seen to be connected with intent and people say, well, I don't intend it, so it can't be me. Um, and yet what I found fascinating about your thesis, which I think provides some hope, um, if I could call it that, w- was the invitation to see the cause of racism in a historical context. The word you use is brainwashed. Um, you yeah. say we've all been indoctrinated to believe that one colour is purest and best. You also say it's less a political issue than a humanitarian issue. Um, can you explain that a little more and tell us how you arrived at that conclusion? Well, first of all, Sam, I want I want people to tell me how that can be a political issue when you talk about human rights and human beings. Mm. So I throw that through the window immediately. I disregard anybody that's going to tell me anything about being a political issue. Now, when we talk about you now the brainwashing. I can give you many, many examples of all that. I don't know if you guys were brought up in the in a Christian household. I was. Every picture I saw of Jesus Christ, every cross I saw with him stretched out, nailed to the cross. He ha- was pale skin, blonde hair, blue eyes. Is it possible? for someone to have looked like that in those times in the region that he's supposed to be from? No. But that is what they try to inculcate into people. Mm. That is purity. That is what you must look at and and regard that as purity. The man who was supposed to have betrayed him, he's portrayed as black. Mm. That is sin. No... Isn't that brainwashing? Mm -hmm. Isn't that then telling people from the very beginning that this is the way the world must be? If you look at what happened with Africa, gentlemen, there could never ever be people just get up one day and say, oh, we just want to slaughter these people, we want to take whatever riches they have in there in the court. They had to make sure that they were dehumanized first. Yeah. So that when it was being done, people would not think that they were doing anything wrong. So that is that that is not just something that happened overnight. That was a plan over a period of time. If you know about the meeting that they had in Germany, when they decided, okay, we're going to just divide up Africa. You can take that. You can take that Britain. You take that France. You whatever, whatever. Because they didn't want to be fighting amongst themselves over it. How can you think that you're dealing with human beings like yourself mm. and do that? Mm. So it was a long-term plan to get to that point where when you start to do things like that, people are okay with it. Mm. I made mention also of a slave ship that had too many slaves on it. Yeah. And at one point, they had to jettison their cargo, as they put it, they threw slaves overboard because the ship was going down because they, were, they, they had too many slaves on the ship. And yet, when they got back to England, they claimed insurance mm. because the people they threw overboard were, were cargo. And their lawyer argued that they, the man lost cargo, so the insurance should pay. How, in today's world, would anyone ever try to go to court and try something like that? But they had to make sure that all the teachings, everything that they did leading up to things like that, people would not think that they were doing anything wrong. And that is where the brainwashing started and where the brainwashing continues because if if you grow up being told that this man is inferior to you or that person is superior to you, it will continue through the generations. Mm. I know people, my mother... My mother was brown skin, not white, but brown skin because she was mixed. She married a black man in Jamaica. Her family jettisoned her. Mm. Didn't want to know her anymore. She should not be marrying this black man because he is below her. So, and you're talking about in the early 20th century. Mm. I was born in 54. I'm the last in the family. My parents were born 1917, 1919. That is the thought process. It goes through generations and generations. You have people 
that buy cream to try and lighten their face. Look at Michael Jackson, what he did to himself mm. to try and look more European. Because that is what is in your head. That is what you are, you are told. This is the ideal. Mm. So it, brainwashing has been going on for a very long time. And we have to re-educate people to get rid of that brainwashing. It's interesting, Mikey, how long it's been going for. Because the, I, I had the point here as well about that slave ship. 132 slaves jettisoned overboard. The, the Solicitor General in the case said, what is this claim that human people have been thrown overboard? This, this is a case of chattels or goods. Blacks are goods and property. It is madness to yep. accuse these well-serving honourable men of murder. The case is the same as if wood had been thrown overboard. And you, so you might think, well, well, okay, that was 1781. Like doesn't, that doesn't still really happen today. But then you look at even Australia with the Indigenous community, they weren't even recognised as part of the population until 1967. You know, so yes. they, they, these ideas still... They were, they were on for now. Right. So they still, you know, perpetuate, you know, right through until today, really, isn't it? You, you, you can find examples of the dehumanization right throughout history. You know? People keep on telling me, oh, that's a long time ago, the 18th century and the 19th century. I give an example in my book of a mixed-race couple in Florida mm. who wanted to remortgage their home. They brought in a evaluator. They have their pictures. You, you don't change anything in your house. You have yeah. your wedding pictures. You are black. Your husband is white. Your kid is, is mixed. You have your family's pictures all over. The, you have the books that you read. They're all there. They come in. They do evaluation. They give, say it's $10 they value the place at. Mm. They go away. The lady says, but I don't understand. Oh, they can't tell me my house is valued at $10. And I know a lot of homes in the same area, on the same street, are being sold for a lot more than this. Mm. She decides with her husband to change everything in the house. Get rid of all the wedding pictures that has her in it. Get rid of her kids' pictures. Get rid of anything that has black in it. Got rid of a book by Barack Obama and any other author that was black. Call someone else to give them a valuation. It went up by $135,000 because there was no sign of any blackness in the house. And this is September 2019. 20, yeah, I think it might have been September 2019. That is not a long time ago. Yeah. So don't keep on telling me that, oh, that's a long time ago. You must forget it. It's still, it's still going on. Mm. It's a lot more subtle now. You no longer have lynching, but you have murders. Mm. And if people didn't have cameras now on their phones, it would still be continuing unabated, unpunished. Marky, um, the book is so uh, beautifully organised uh, around the title of Why We Kneel, How We Rise, and the chapters sort of reflect that process of explaining why it is that we kneel, and then there's some great stuff toward. Well, there's great stuff all through it, but particularly towards the end about how we rise. So it's not just about outlining problems and bugbears. Um, no. But 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 uh, why we kneel is connected, I suppose, to the um, to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which was very hot when the Sky moment happened. We talked about the subtleties of language earlier. Someone says Black Lives Matter. Someone else says All Lives Matter. It's quite clear if you want it to be clear that the phrase is intended to mean Black Lives Matter too. Um, not that only Black Lives Matter. What what do you make of those who presume that um, if you can find one problem or pick one hole in a complex campaign, that it somehow invalidates every part of it? How do you respond to that mm. other than just sheer exasperation? Well, when I see that, I know that that person or those people are just looking for an excuse not to support the cause. As you said, you'll find a little hole. It's like you're, go you're going to war. These people are going to war with, with, with the problem that we have. They are going to war with the cause. And they are looking for some weakness somewhere along the line to just focus on that weakness. Now, that is one thing that people focus on. The political as aspect of the organization, Black Lives Matter. Now, I don't even know who formed that organization. I have never been on their website. All I'm talking about is the three words that Black Lives Matter. Mm. Now, if people are going to be looking for those little weaknesses to try and bring down the focus from 
what it really is, I know where they stand. They don't want to support it. So I understand where they are coming from. I will look for an excuse not to go to a party that I don't want to go to. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing. Mm. Oh, I didn't, I didn't take, take down my shoes this morning. I didn't clean my shoes this morning. Oh, my shirt is in the laundry. I, that sort of rubbish, you can give it as an excuse, but people will see it through you. If you want to support something here, you will support it. And as I, people keep on asking me what I'd like to see the England team do or cricket do, no, it's not what I would like to see anyone do. It's what people can see with the situation and decide if they need to support this or not. You should never have a police force going around this to tell people to take a knee or do this, or do that. Because people will do it, and they'll go home, and they'll just tick the box. Okay, I did that. I can move on now. If you're supporting a cause, you support a cause. Why I am so adamant about taking a knee is because that is the worldwide recognition of supporting Black Lives Matter. That Everybody knows that that is about Black Lives Matter. So when you go down on your knee, and you take a knee, everybody knows exactly where you're coming from. But that cannot be the be all and end all. That is just a signal, that's just a gesture. Other work has to be done beyond that. It, uh, it reminds me of one of my favorite stand up bits by a guy called Michael Che, who's talking about it's like from 2015 or 16, and he's talking about um, people who say all lives matter in response to Black Lives Matter. And he says, It's like if your wife says to you, Do you love me? And he says, Baby, I love everybody. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, I wonder. Um, I wonder. Uh, you know, how, do you find this? Do you find it draining sometimes, Mike? You know, we've spoken to some, you know, indigenous cricketers in Australia, and sort of you ask them about race, and and you're sort of asking them to represent the entire indigenous population. You know, and it's not that's not fair. That's why is that on them? Do you do you feel? Do you feel a little bit like that as well? Like, why is it my responsibility to show white people? like walk their hand through this, you know, to, to show them what, what is real, you know, what the real experiences are of, you know, ethnic minorities or, or indigenous people or, or black people or whatever, you know, do, do you find it like I shouldn't have to do this? Not really, no, to be honest. I know I shouldn't have to do it, but I know I have to do it. Right. The thing is, I have no problem if people are willing to talk and to have a conversation and for me and to engage me on the subject. Mm. I have a problem when people just try to just write it off and say, oh, there's no such thing, or you know, you have a chip on your shoulder, and because they don't want to see. Their life is nice and cozy, and they're happy, they're cushy. They don't, they, they don't want anything to change. Mm. So they don't want to see anything at all, apart from what they have in their mind as the right, as what the way the world is. Mm. Those people it's going to be a tough haul to get them to understand. But I, there are a lot of people that want to understand, that want to engage and want to see. Mm. And I am happy to engage with people like that. Mm. Mm. Marky, uh, and I think as our chat goes on, you've given us so much of your time as well. So um, we're, we're so grateful. Um, so we will continue to chat with you about this. Um, no I'm looking problem. forward to chatting lately, uh, later, later about that, that element of how we rise as well. Um, if you wouldn't mind it, I actually went to an old cricket teammate of mine whose name is uh, Sam Pararaja Singham. We, we all played lower levels than you. Um, <laughs> so, he's a, so did everyone in the history. <laughs> um, Could have had Gordon Greenwich on. <laughs> he's, a, he's a barrister in Sydney uh, of Sri Lankan heritage, and, and he, he put this to me ahead of this interview. He's quite obsessed with you, I have to say, and he'll hate that I said that, but in, in, a, in a very admirable way. Um, he, he wrote to me, if you mind, don't mind me putting it to you, he wrote, I, I recall during the 06 Pakistan tour of England, Pakistan forfeited the, a game on the basis of an allegation of ball tampering. Um, Holding wrote a piece in which he said, there is a double standard at work in cricket, and this episode has only highlighted it. When England used reverse swing to beat the Australians in the 05 Ashes, everyone said it was great skill. I can't say they were tampering with the ball then, um, but no one even contemplated the idea that they could possibly be getting reverse swing the unfair way. When Pakistan does it, the opposite happens. No one thinks it is a great skill. Everyone associates it with skullduggery. When bombs go off in Karachi and Colombo, everyone wants to go 
home. When bombs go off in London, no one says anything. That is first world hypocrisy and we have to live with it. And Sam goes on to say that resonated with me then and continues to do so. I'm curious whether Michael stands by that to this day and whether he still believes first world hypocrisy is something we simply have to live with or endure. I wouldn't say we simply have to live it, live with it. The hypocrisy stems from the mere fact of arrogance. That is how we, we all started with this thing. When you go back to, to the, I'm gonna come, come back to it, but I want to show you where that all started as well. When you go back to Christopher Columbus, when they keep on telling you he discovered here, he discovered there. This Christopher Columbus went to Jamaica where I'm from. People were already living there. People were doing their trade, doing what, whatever. How do you discover a place that people are already living and trading and, and going about their business? Mm. How do you discover that place? You make Europe aware of it. But because of the arrogance of Europe, unless we know about it, it doesn't exist. Well, we come back now mm. again to what we're having now with the hypocrisy. Again, it's because we can do it. We are superior. We are allowed to do it. Mm. You are inferior. You are not allowed to do things like that. And that is where it stems from. And I'm hoping that when we can all see that we are all human beings and we are all equal on this earth, that sort of hypocrisy and that sort of arrogance will go away. I wrote that and said that at the time, because that is the world we, we live in. But I'm hoping that we'll go beyond that at, at some point. Mm. I remember in the Makai Rintini chapter, Mike, he, he, he's talking about, I think at the time, he played 101 tests, I think, for South Africa. And, and yeah. throughout his career, he was plagued as sort of being quoted as, you know, a, a, as a quota player, you know, after the apartheid and stuff. And, and, and even after he had... 200 test match wickets. I think I think he's the third highest wicket taker in South African history. I think that's right. Um, and even still, yeah. he's been you, he's been sort of cited as a quota player. You know, like why 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 is that? Again, that is because people want to pick at a system. Mm. People are unhappy with the fact that they have this quota system in South Africa, and as Makaya says, he's against it because it impacts directly on him mm. and gives him a stigma. I did an interview with, with Ali Baka way back in the 2003 World Cup where I was telling him that I didn't think it was a great idea either, but I can understand why it was done. And that is the problem. Mm. When you have people that are against a particular thing, they will try every way in the book to belittle that, whatever it is that they're against. I remember when Hashim Amla started playing for South Africa, some commentators were saying he should not be there. He's no good. He's only there because the quota system and if the team was being selected on merit, he would not be in the team. Hashim Amla became a great South African batsman. I didn't hear those same arguments about um, the great all-rounder. My head is on the Callis. Jack Callis, I think he, uh, he played a ton of test matches before he was a success. Mm. But while leading up to that, we didn't hear arguments like that. Mm. None. And I made mention of that once on Sky at Lords. Because I'm not afraid to talk about things like that. But again, I'm hoping that one day we'll go beyond all that. Where people can just see people as people. And Makaya and Tini, he said the solution. Makaya and Tini, he tells us that his kids know, white kids come home with his kids and they're yeah. all mixing together, all learning each other's culture, all learning about each other. Yeah. So that is things like that make me hopeful. Yeah. And also uh, Thierry Henry is talking about in the, the 98 World Cup when France won, there was a whole bunch of, there was a whole conversation at the time around, you know, how many black players were in the team and then they had all the mm -hmm. same tropes that you always hear, you know, ill-disciplined, lazy, no tracking yeah. back, all this kind of thing. And then when they won in 20, when was the last World Cup? 2018 maybe? Um, there, was, there was less of that chat. But I sort of, I still, you still see those tropes, don't you, about, you know, identifying with black professional athletes in any sport, you know, lazy, ill-disciplined. And I, 
I wonder if that's sort of part of the part of the conversation, Mikey, around you know Joffa Archer, for instance. You still see little whispers of that, you know, just lazy. You know, how much does he really want it? Ill discipline. Do you know what I mean? It's it's still just a little bit of a dog whistle that still that still exists. You'll always get it for for the time being. As I said, I hope eventually it will go. But mm. you know, it is difficult for it to just disappear. Sure. I expect it will take a long time for people to stop having those little thoughts in their minds that once they see the color of a man's skin, they start getting ideas about, about different things. Mm. You know, hopefully that will not last too long. Mm. Mm. It's there. I don't know what you can do about it right now, apart from educating people so that they stop having those thoughts in their minds. Mm. Mm. Mikey, um, j- one more thing from my barrister friend who's uh, far more um, eloquent than I on these issues. He actually wrote this piece on a, uh, called Race and the Bar uh, around the legal profession in Australia, but I think it's yeah. – and, and you have a chapter with Adam Goods, uh, which is mm. incredible in this book as well. Um, he, he says, I, I come to firmly, I've come to firmly believe there is a sense in Australia that cultural minorities are permitted to participate in this great democracy on strict terms and generally speaking in conformity with a widely understood – yet ultimately reductive view of their position within society. As long as that minority conforms to the view, they can participate in the, in the democracy and enjoy its benefits. They're welcomed with open arms in those circumstances. However, there is a constraint on those individuals depriving them from reaching their full potential. Any deviation is criticised, and he uses the example of Adam Goods. Subtle differences in character are overlooked. He then says it takes a big character to push through such impediments. So I'm going to ask you about from those you've spoken to and you as well, if it has related to you. Uh, he says, I'm curious whether Michael agrees with that observation um, and how you have navigated those issues, if at all. It has been a lot easier for me. You know, growing up in Jamaica, I, d- I didn't live those experiences a lot day in, day out. So it was a lot easier for me. Every time, as I said in the book, I, I was a bit selfish. Every time I went overseas and I came across it, I kept on telling myself, you'll soon be home. You don't have to deal with this at home. I admire people who have had to live with it day in, day out, and have still coped and have still excelled. They have excelled in spite of, not because of. And those people are strong. They have to be extremely strong. Ebony Rainford Brent, when I spoke to Ebony about her experiences in England, I knew, I said to myself, I could never have gone through what she went through and just kept quiet and just tried to continue and play the game. I perhaps would have ended up in jail because I have had some bad reaction at some point and lost my temper and do something that I should not have done. Because as a young man, I was a little bit fiery. When you're a fast bowler, you're going to be fiery. <laughs> and as people know, I kicked out, I kicked out a stump in New Zealand in 1980. <laughs> I was awesome. 26 years old. So I was... I was that's other sort of person that perhaps would have lost my composure under certain circumstances. I did a, a chapter with Ebony, and I, when she read the chapter, she came back to me and she said, Mikey, please, I know I said I would get involved with the book, but please, I cannot go through this. I cannot have this being exposed. I cannot be living this every day, people reading about this. Mm. And I have to take the chapter out of the book. I could not, I'm telling you, I I don't care how strong people think I might might be, but I could not have gone through that as a, as a human being and come out the other side normal. That's um that's incredible, incredibly sad as well. I know I know you said in the book at some stage that you know for some reason women get a little bit more aggression as well, especially online. You see it, let alone mixed with 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 race as well. I mean, it's so it's so disheartening to know that you had to take out an entire chapter because she couldn't, you know, um, go through you know more publicity. I wonder um. I wonder, Mikey, you know, how, how enlightening was your conversation with Adam Goods? It was obviously, you know, here in Australia, the story is, you know, very well known now. Um, but, you know, his what he went through, starting with being abused by a 13-year-old girl at the MCG one time, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but you, you obviously toured Australia. You debuted in Brisbane. Did, did you, did you, you know, I guess what I'm asking is how much did his story resonate with sort of abuse from the crowd or, or, or origins of that nature? Again, I, I got a little bit of that in Australia, but yeah. it, believe me, the good outweighed the bad. Sure. And by a huge distance, 
And if you're not living it, if you're not coming across it every day, mm. it's a lot easier. I got, I, I related a story in the book about being in the lift and the lift door opening and a gentleman standing there and refusing to come in and then as the lift is closing, he passes a racist remark. You know, if I was living in Australia and facing that every day, mm. my reaction would not have been the reaction that I had then. I just laughed it off then. And I thought to myself, what an ass. Mm. But if I'm living it every day and coming across it every day, as Adam was, eventually it got to him, he retired. More than likely, I would have suffered the same thing. As I said to a journalist in a call before, before this one, he, he said to me, do I regret not reacting to some of this racial abuse and some of this racism when I was a younger man? I said, not really, because if I did, I would not be around today to do what I'm doing now. I would not, I would not have had a career that I had as a cricketer. I would not have had a career as a broadcaster. And I would not be here to do what I'm doing now because... Black men in those times, when they came out against racism and said did anything or did anything, they were ostracized. Mm. Go back to Mexico, the great John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Look at your Australian gentleman who came second, who did absolutely nothing else but suggest to them that they share the one pair of black gloves that they have one on each hand. That's all he did. He stood there. While the anthem was being played, behaved impeccably, but because he suggested them how they could, could demonstrate their displeasure, he was ostracized by the Australian government and the Australian people. The Australian government had to apologize to his family many, many years after when he was dead and gone. He, did, he doesn't even know that he, he had been forgiven. He should not have to have been forgiven in the first place. Mm. But that is what they do to people who speak up and to who say anything against race in those days. Even, I shouldn't even say those days. Look at Colin Kaepernick. Mm. What has happened to Colin Kaepernick? His career came to an end. So it is good to say, oh, you should have said something. And in theory, I would love to say, yes, I should have said something. But I know in practice, I would not be where I am now. As we speak, Marky, I keep thinking... Uh, about how different audiences might react and you know there's this um, um, there's a smaller sect of people who might be like oh this is just a uh, this is a litany of um, of issues and problems and complaints uh, but where are the solutions and I just want to say um, as I look through all of our questions there are more things that I want to talk about and more things that I'd love your views on um, in relation to these problems because I think I think we need to hear more, you know, and we will get we will get there because um, you say some wonderful things about education, etc. But I, I want to stick with the Adam Goods chapter as well because because there is this biting, unflinching explanation of the stolen generations here in Australia mm. in that chapter, um, starting with Adam recounting his experience of his mum being taken away, um, and uh, and then you, you go on to refer to Australia's very effective PR machine as to why many around the world haven't heard of it, haven't heard of the stolen generations, and you ponder those moments um, around, and you wonder, sorry, you know, do Australians even know what racism is? Could they ever know? And that if there was education reform and an environment for those conversations to take place, there would still be people not willing to listen. Um getting people to understand the concept of trauma passed down from generation to generation is hard, um, too hard. I is that still your view? Oh, yes, definitely. Mm. Definitely. People, <clears throat> for those who say where the solutions are, it is simple. As I said before, people need to be educated as to exactly what the situation is with human beings and races and we are the racism started, how it started, why it started. If you can understand that, that is leading you towards a solution to say, oh, this is not necessary. When it comes down to what Adam Woods went through, in that same chapter, Sam, you would have seen him saying to himself, this will never end. And his elders saying, Adam, don't be like that. Look where we are coming from. So things are improving. Things are getting better. They are coming from so far back that people, as they are living, will think to themselves, we are getting nowhere. I had a similar situation with a young 20-odd-year-old girl, young lady, working with Sky. 
so late last year who was, who was telling me it will never change things will never get better look what is happening now i said you are too young to understand where we are coming from mm. if you see where we are coming from you see that we have made progress we still have a long way to go but we have made progress and that is what people need to understand as well and as for a litany of complaints if they want the litany of complaints, I could have done 10 encyclopedias <laughs> of examples of the ill treatment of people. I put, you have to put some in because you have to show people what took place. As I said, it's a journey. You no longer have a lot of things that took place a long time ago happening now. You still have some injustices, but things are improving. And the more educated people become, the more improvement you will get in life. It's interesting, Mikey, when uh, talking about education, you, you were saying that the sort of the, the, the benefits of education are twofold in that if you sort of educate black kids about black excellence and, and how to succeed, then it makes them feel good. But then secondly, it also shows white kids that they, they sort of start seeing black people as their peers or equals, right? They're equals, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is, that is the point. And remember what I said from the beginning, you know, it was a plan. This didn't just happen overnight and by chance. Mm. All the black accomplishments have been airbrushed out of history. There have been so many great black people and people of color, but it didn't fit the narrative of white superiority or white supremacy. So they are airbrushed out of history. We're going through a pandemic right now. Serious, lots of people have died. The first person to make the Western world aware of inoculations was a black man, a slave, one semester, wrote about him. He told his master in Boston when smallpox was wiping out Boston about what he had seen and learned in Africa. Mm. And of course, him being a slave, nobody was interested. When his master told other white folks about it, they bombed his house. How can he be listening to what a slave had to say? One other person who heard what he was talking about tried it with his household, his slaves and his household. And he saved, I think he lost about four people. He saved the majority of his household by that method of inoculation. But nobody has ever spoken about that. Many, many years afterwards, we hear about this Dr. Jenner in England, who is a white man who did this experiment with smallpox, with cowpox. And he all of a sudden is the Lord and the master of vaccinations and inoculation. It happened a long time before him. Mm. You go on the street every day, you see traffic lights. A black man invented the first three-way traffic light. Who knows that? Mm. It's the plan, it's the way that they structured the world to make sure that the narrative, let me add one word, the false narrative of white superiority should continue. Mm. Don't highlight what black people have done. You see a few films being made that have highlighted great things that black people have done. But you hear people say, oh, that's a movie. Did it really happen? Like the Tuskegee Airmen, the, the, the fighter squadron that the Americans had that were all black pilots. You see a movie about it. But is that taught in schools? No. You see a movie about the black women that were basically the computers before computers were made for the, for the launch to the moon. People see the movie, but is it ever taught in schools? No. No black achievements are taught in schools mm. because it doesn't fit the narrative of white superiority. Mm. I, think, uh, I think it was Thierry again who was talking about you know, often when black people are celebrated, it's for their physical attributes. You know, they're amazing athletes yes. or whatever, but but they're very, very rarely, if ever, celebrated for, you know, um, business success or, or mental success or whatever. And you sort of see that as well in, in sport, where where are the black coaches in any sport? You know, it, it's it's well documented, you know, Sol Campbell in football uh, struggled to get a job, even there's one of the greatest Arsenal players ever. You know, there, there are very few black coaches. Same thing with like cricket. We were talking the other day of like, imagine if, imagine if the Australian cricket team didn't have, or had like an Indian coach or, mm. you know, a, a, a Bangladeshi coach or a Caribbean coach or whatever. It'd be like, you know, whoa, what's this? You know, so it's, it, it's, it's interesting that 
for the time being at the at the moment, it seems that like black people are celebrated for their physical achievements. Yep. And that's basically it. They put you in a box. This is right. this is where you are going. Yeah. Don't think of coming outside of this box. Mm. And you know, I made mention of this to an English gentleman that England has a very, very long way to go. I saw where a department store over Christmas ran an ad with a black couple. And the amount of derogatory terms and remarks and comments yeah. that they got. Then there was an ITV program, a quiz program. There are three black couples on the program. Ofcom got so many complaints about why do you have three black couples on this program? No, what is wrong with that? <laughs> no, I, I just cannot understand people's thinking. Yeah. And yet America, where I thought racism was a lot more stringent, a lot more hard and difficult to deal with, they seem to be accepting that things need to change. When you look at ad American advertisements on the television, the amount of mixed race couples and the amount of black people seeing the ads, it is unbelievable. Mm. When you look at the companies, the corporations who are putting up money to, towards programs to try and level the playing field, tons. The biggest corporations in America are doing that. I don't hear anything happening in the UK. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, when in, in the chapter on Adam Goods, Mark, he, uh, he wrote, when I asked Adam Goods about how we can bring about change, uh, he turned the question around to you asking not what people of colour could do but what their friends and neighbours from a different creed or culture could do. Um, perhaps he asked that rhetorically and it's not the right one to pose to you, but do, do you have thoughts on that? Definitely. But, but we can't do it on our own. Black people can't do this on our own. There's no way we can change the world on our own. And Thierry Henry had a similar comment as well. When a reporter said to him, if somebody passed a derogatory remark to you on the football field, would you walk off the field? And Thierry looked at the reporter and said, ask one of my white players, ask one of them if they would walk off the field if they heard somebody mm. shouting the race, race, racist abuse at me. Don't ask me that. Ask one of them. Well, we have to do it together. If only the black people are going to react, if only the black people are going to complain, where are we going? Nowhere. This has to be done together. Mm. The white folks have to understand that things are wrong and try and help the black folks along, along the way so that we can get this thing sorted. It will, I, as again, I am very hopeful where that is concerned as well because if you look at the marches in the Martin Luther King days, 90%, 95% black. Look at what happened during the Black Lives Matter marches. You had about 40, 45% white people amongst, amongst the marchers. Mm. So younger generation is recognizing the problem. And hopefully it will continue that way that people will recognize that things are wrong and we'll all come together to try and solve the problem. I think, um, I think it's sort of well stated that, that education is a, is a huge part of how to solve racism i can use solve in the right term there and i noticed in the book you're not you're not asking to edit history or rewrite history what you're asking for is the unedited version of history because we saw people when was that was that last year 2019 people tearing down statues you know and some people some people were like oh well you're rewriting history there and it's like no we're, no. we're, we're 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 actually talking about what actually happened there was the people who were you know who who yeah, sold thousands of hundreds of thousands of slaves to people being celebrated in statue form. Those people should be torn down, you know. It's, so it's so you're sort of saying that it's it's in, in the educational sense, it's it's not about rewriting history. It's about showing the actual history, which maybe younger people are are, are able to access the information of well, the truth. Truth, yeah, yeah, exactly. More more information is accessible now. Yeah. So people are learning a lot more than when I was a kid growing up. Yeah. When I was a kid growing up, they gave you a textbook, and what was in the text textbook was gospel. There was no internet for you to do your own research or go into the library. What was in the library was what they want you to read. So people have more information now. People are finding out things for, for themselves now. And you're so right about this people complaining about editing history. History has already been edited. Mm. What we want is the unedited version. As I said again to another gentleman, a journalist earlier on, 
I have never seen a statue of Hitler anywhere. And people don't celebrate Hitler. Mm. He was evil. So why are you celebrating these people who did evil? And if you cannot believe that the transatlantic slave trade was evil, you have a problem and mm. you're part of the problem. Mm. Yeah, just thinking, Mark, and I haven't really even packaged this question together. We were talking about uh, quota systems and, and I suppose actual... Um, you know, action to try and, you mentioned that term, level the playing field before. And um, I personally believe in affirmative action. And I think the hard part of that is that those who are in the superior position must actually experience some sacrifice or some pain to help level the playing field from what they previously had. I know that's a, that's a broad term, but uh, I suppose what you're saying is before those actions can take place, the education has to take place. You know, once you understand the truth of what happens, then you, from that position, we can make decisions about how to make things better and how to create more equality, however that looks. Would that be a, 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 some active listening on my part? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. But if you don't understand why something is being done, you'll always be against it. Mm. If you don't understand the injustices that took place, you will, you will say, why should I be involved in this? this? This is an injustice to me. But you have got to understand where it's coming from and what people are trying to do. When it comes to the quota system, I think I made it clear in the book, along with Makaya, that I think opportunities should, should be given on the quota systems at basic level, grassroots level. Make sure everybody at that level has the opportunity presented to them. And again, I had this conversation with Ali Baka about taking, going out and identifying young black talent and then taking them to these special schools. No, I don't believe in that. And Makaya Ntini tells you that when he was taken out of his environment to go into the school, he was lost. What you need is to spread the net. Don't bring people into the net. Spread the net so that at more schools and more places of the facilities that can produce these cricketers. Don't cherry pick one from here and cherry pick one from there and then put them in these special schools. Mm. That's not going to solve the problem long term. Give everyone an opportunity. Give more people an opportunity. Not, I, when I, I've been going to South Africa every year for the last seven years. And I talk to left, right, center, red, green, white, black, whatever. And some of the kids there will tell you that they got opportunities to go to like a camp. But these are black kids now coming like from Suez to Alexandria or one, or one of those places. But to get to wherever this camp is, they have to get up so early in the morning. They can't have breakfast because they have to catch two or three different minibuses to get to the camp with their gear. By the time they get there, they are tired, they are hungry. They obviously cannot perform the way they would like to perform. They are capable under the, the, the circumstances. And people will tell them that they got an opportunity. Mm. No, they didn't get an opportunity. Mm. If the camps or more facilities were available where they are from or close to where they are from, they would have a better opportunity to, to produce their, their, their goods. And that is what I'm talking about. Mm giving people opportunity, equal, level the playing field. Mm -hmm. Don't make a man have to drive 500 miles and somebody get dropped off by a car 15 minutes from where he lives after he has had his breakfast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to work with a, uh, in an Indigenous mentoring organisation. You always saw um, the same concept, Mikey, of kids being taken out of their community, say in the Northern Territory or whatever, and put on a scholarship in a private school in Melbourne, and it creates the problems that you were talking about there, or it can create those problems not just for, uh, you know, often for the kid who is ostracized from their community because the kids, the other kids at home going, well, why do you get to do that and not yeah. me? And, um, it, yeah. you know, so it is, it is complex. Mm. I'm, I'm wondering with um, just the, uh, the, the unflinching, robust nature of what you're saying in this book, particularly focusing on those elements of education that have been whitewashed, that have been edited. Um, what are you expecting in terms of um, uh, a reaction to that from those who want to retain the status quo, you know, and when it comes to talking about this book, will you be going out to those places and making those arguments? Because there will be people, um, wrongly, but there will be people who will try and attack it or discredit what you're saying or um, or question those educational 
theories uh, or, or suppositions that you're making as well. How will you approach that? Well, I am ready to debate anything with any one of them. At the moment, I don't expect this British government to enjoy this book. Because especially with the prime minister in charge right now, mm. he has made some comments there that are just off the wall. So I don't expect, and even apart from that, last year sometime, I understand that a letter was written by a lot of past members of parliament in the UK targeting the current government about the curriculum in the schools. And the government immediately just brushed this aside. No, what we are teaching is the way to go. We're not interested in change, changing the curriculum. And then one comment was made something about, there's no way we're going to tell our kids that they have the white privilege. We cannot tell kids that. No, again, you can see where the attack is coming from, the, the war that they are fighting. They're not looking to have a conversation about the thing to see exactly what people are really referring to. They just want to make sure that they are on the attack, on the attack, throw out false narratives. So I am not expecting, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that outside of even the power houses, that people will understand and people will then bring pressure to bear from outside. That's what I'm hoping for. Just note a, a quote from the book, Mikey, about white privilege. It says, white privilege doesn't mean you're getting a free ride. It just means that whatever hurdles you have to cross are not put there because of the color of your skin, which I find really interesting because a lot of white people, and I'll speak for all white people now. Yeah, please. That, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's always helpful. <laughs> how, how, how we feel, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we'll say that, you know, I worked hard. I worked hard to so got what I get. I, I didn't get any. I didn't get any privileges. I didn't get any special, uh, you know, compensation or anything. I, I just worked hard. I got a good job. I, I work hard to buy my house and you know whatever. I mean, I've done none of those things, but I hear, I hear people say that. But <laughs> 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 but you know that's that's sort of the that's sort of the the idea of white privilege, isn't it? That it's 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 almost subliminal to people because they don't they don't see it. They don't see that they've experienced it. Yes, because they don't quite understand what it is. Just as you said there, they're saying, oh, I have never gotten anything free. I've had to work hard for everything that I've got. Yes, all of us have to try and work hard for what, whatever we get. Yeah. But the black man has to get over the hurdle of having black skin before he even starts working. Yeah. Before he even thinks about what he's trying to achieve. A white person doesn't have to do that. They start off with that privilege. But people hear the word privilege and think it means they are being given something, yeah. that they are getting a free ride. Nobody's getting a free ride, but you have less hurdles to, 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 to jump. Mm -hmm. I can tell you about my own experiences, uh, and I'll go back to the book afterwards, but I'll tell you about my personal experience where I, I was invited to a venue. Something is that I have a great deal of interest in, and I was in this, like, this boardroom or whatever it is. And someone came in. I was early. You know, I got there early. I don't like to be late. So I was there long before I should have even have been there. Someone opened the door, saw me in there. And it was almost as if they were coming to all me to find, what the hell are you doing in here? And then they recognized that it was me. So immediately, you know, everything was calm again. But all they saw first was the black skin. Mm. And they figured, what is this black man doing in here? But then it's, oh, shit, it's Michael Holding. It's fine. It's, it's, it's okay. So that's the first hurdle, mm. having a black skin. Mm. A white person in there, they, they would perhaps still have gone up to them to, if they didn't know who it was to, to you know, ask them if they can help or whatever. But not what I saw coming to us me initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is what people need to understand. Mm. It's not about getting material things for nothing. It's about starting off on the second rung of the ladder. As one as Shannon Sharp in the United States, I don't know if you guys follow NFL. Shannon Sharp on a program up there said to his partner, Skip, the two of them have a, have a program. He said, Skip, you white guys are on third base looking to run home. We black guys are still waiting on our first pitch. Mm. Mm. I, I, I noticed uh, in the in the book, talk about Usain and Thierry. They're talking about fame, their fame and their peak. 
got them outside of the racism prism. You know, they, they sort of got to experience what it was like to be white, basically, because Thierry Henry talks about he's going into a shop buying a watch or something like that. And he walks in and it's like, oh, Thierry, come in. You know, he doesn't get asked, are you sure you can afford that? Which I know is an experience that you had. Mm. In you yeah. saying bold as well. You saying bold as well, you know. Yeah. And then and then Thierry, when he's he, he's recognised in Europe, but when he went to the US to play for New York, I think it was. Um, the coach in New York. Coach in New York. And then he's waiting for an Uber and the Uber driver sees him and just dri- drives off. And that was just sort yeah. of, it was so, so because like his fame, I think I think the words he said that he he became seen again, like you know he he, he became black again. He became black again. Became black again. That's right. That's right. And you know it's so it's almost the, the the fame prism can take you outside of being black for a moment, and you sort of feel what it's like to be white, which is just an unbelievably shocking thing. Exactly. You know, as we said in the book, if you are famous, it can save you. Or it can uh, it can protect you mm. amongst those who know you. Once you get outside of that prison of those people that know you, you're right back to second class again. And that is the problem. Yeah. We need to go beyond that. Yeah, Marky, uh, uh, you mentioned before that without uh, a cricket career, uh, you perhaps wouldn't have had the opportunity to do what you've done now. Um, and this isn't really a helpful question, but I want to know anyway. Do, do you consider this work more important than what you did playing cricket? If it brings the right results, Sam, I'll consider this a whole heap more important. But if all that happens is people get upset and people don't want to understand and it causes more angst than anything else, I, well, I'm 67. I can easily go in the background and let people fight. Mm. <laughs> but if we achieve what we are hoping to achieve with this book, just getting more understanding, and I think I already got that from some people, but this needs to spread, spread amongst tons and tons of people, not just a few people. If we can achieve that, this will be a lot more important than any 10-wicket hall or any test match that I played in and won. Mm. I think uh, I think it's the first line in the book, but um, thank God it rained that day. Thank God it rained that day in <laughs> Southampton. Yeah. Oh. yeah, well, if it hadn't rained, you know, all this wouldn't wouldn't have happened. Yeah, because we would have just produced the video. I wasn't able to expand in the video on everything I wanted to, to talk about. Mm. That video was there, yes, but it was pretty brief again because of time constraints leading up yeah. or what we thought with a limited time leading up to the first ball being bowled. And what, when it rained, we had an opportunity. And of course, Ian Ward, I think he did a brilliant job actually mm. to bring it up and to allow me to talk because a lot of other people would have interjected what they want to do and yeah. come in and say what they want to say and all that. And he just allowed me to flow. Well, Mikey, uh, this is a Why We Kneel, How We Rise. It's a very special piece of work. I can't believe that us two idiots um, <laughs> who play great cricket have had a chance to to talk with you. It's it's you know it's something that we'll treasure forever. And um, th- this is a book that is written with clarity and wisdom on a on a subject that can be abstract for many people for many reasons that you outline. Um, I think you should do an audio book if you haven't, because I'd listen to the shit out of that as well. Um, but, um, no, you know, you... I'm doing it as well. Okay. Uh, we're recording June 7th, 8th and 9th. I'll just sit down in the studio and, and, and read it. All right. Oh, sorry for That's swearing. Awesome. Um, you, 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 <laughs> you, right. you said, I, I, in relation to this book, you know, it, it's like you've bowled the ball and found the edge. Um, now it's up to others to, to take the catch and complete the job. So uh, hopefully we can all do that. And, uh, you know, we, we would urge listeners to this to um to buy the book or the audio book uh and, and do that uh, mate thank you so much for for joining us uh and, and giving us your thoughts and uh j- wishing you all the best all the best successes with the book thank you very much and thank you james for having me on your, your program and hello to everyone in australia i've always enjoyed touring that country fantastic country thanks very much marky yeah man no problem <laughs>